the tripods as defined by NSF, it means that it needs to involve at least three of the departments, mathematics, statistics, computer science, and computer engineering. We are lucky that we have all the four departments on board in this institute. And today we have a distinguished speaker, Professor Emmanuel Kanders, who is well known in each of these four communities. That's a rare. He's the Burnham Simons Chair in Mathematics and Statistics and Professor of Electrical Engineering at Stanford University. He received numerous awards, including NSF Allen Waterman Award, and a very, very recent, just I read it last month, possibly, 2020 Princess of Austria Award for his outstanding technical and scientific research. He is a member of National Academy of Sciences, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Frankly speaking, if I have to tell all his awards and achievements, possibly I'll take the whole time. So it should go to the best person. Before passing the screen to Professor Candice, i like to thank TAM IDs, that's our own Data Science Institute in Texas a and for co-sponsoring this event. Special thanks go to the director, Nick DeField, you, Dean, and especially Jennifer South. Thank you, guys. So now, Professor Candice, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much for the gracious introduction, uh, for inviting me, and for tuning in. Um, first, let me offer your congratulations for uh, being awarded this prestigious grant from NSF. I know it was extremely competitive. And uh, it's awesome that you got it. And just let me congratulate you and everyone on your team uh, for this. Um, this is a strange time. So we have to do this remotely. Uh, as you know, we're going through the pandemics. Maybe you don't know that California is burning. I'm looking through the window at the moment and I cannot see the, uh, the street. And so if I look, sound down from time to time, it's just because it seems like the world around us uh, is not going very well. And so you'll forgive me if I'm not as joyful as I'm usually am. So um, today I'd like to talk to you about conformal prediction. Uh, it's a very exciting field of research. And I would like to tell you where we stand uh, today. And before we get started, uh, Bani mentioned that, um, you know, data science is about many disciplines. Uh, it's certainly true. I try to touch on these disciplines in this lecture but I have to say that uh, this lecture is uh, very much of a statistical nature and uh, I apologize in advance uh, if it's too statistical. So uh, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, Rina, Aditya and R Ryan who actually introduced me to the field of conformal inference. You'll see some joint work with them in this lecture and conformal prediction, conformal inference has been a a, a hot subject for me uh, in the last year or two, and I would like to tell you about our progress. So machine learning 15 years ago, uh, a hot application then was to predict uh, movie ratings, and uh, I actually worked on it myself. And I think we can all agree that whether we get this right or wrong doesn't really have a lot of consequences. And the stakes are very low. But if we fast forward to today, uh, 2019, 2020, uh, I believe I don't need to convince you that people use machine learning more and more in very sensitive applications uh, where, for example, to recognize uh, drivers uh, in the streets. Perhaps the most sensitive application I know of is to assist uh, uh, judges in making court decisions. Uh, Courts in the United States are buying machine learning tools from a company named uh, Equivent. And they buy a product called Compass that will actually try to predict whether inmates um, will commit another crime if released from jail or not, based on um, data from previous inmates. And so obviously here the, 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 the stakes cannot be higher. Um, I'm sure you all know that HR departments around the country uh, are using machine learning tools. I'm going to use AI and machine learning interchangeably, uh, just the way the industry does. 
uh, to recruit um, talents and we've heard problems with using these tools to recruit uh, people, for example, problems associated with why on earth are uh, CVs from L applicants always coming on top of stacks. Um, and of course, uh, you know, everywhere we go, we talk about machine learning and AI. For example, there's a promise that AI will improve healthcare, will improve medicine itself. And so, uh, of course, these are very sensitive topics. And just as when we were talking about movie ratings, it did not matter where we got it right or wrong. I think it matters enormously today, whether we got, get it right or wrong. And so at the same time, something was actually discussed in this lecture is to make sure that whenever we use machine learning algorithm, they are not biased against certain groups of individuals. I'm sure you know, it's been widely reported that some of the tools I described may carry some biases and we need to be extremely aware of this as well. So um, just to frame a bit the talk and the discussion that we're gonna have, um, it might be useful to think about a concrete example and let's take Stanford University as an example. Uh, of course, this is hypothetical, but still it's useful to think about it this way. Stanford receives about 60,000 applications each year for um, uh, candidates for admission. And, you know, um, as we're going to try to automate this task of selecting candidates, we might actually consider using machine learning tools. And so, of course, um, a company or university might be interested in understanding based on some attributes of applicants, uh, covariates, we're going to call them covariates, or the high school you went to, the your GPA, the courses you took, your ACT scores, your level of physical fitness, your extracurricular activity. Based on all these covariates, we might be interested in understanding how well a particular student would do, let's say, at Stanford. And we can measure this via a quantitative outcome, which might be, for example, the GPA at Stanford after two years of college education. And so, you know, we might actually use your favorite uh, learning algorithm to try to predict from the experience of other students how well you will do and use this prediction uh, to decide or help inform uh, admissions. So you see we have a pipeline here which is data, predictions, actions, and it's extremely important now whether we get it right or wrong because the lives of people are at stake just like in my court example. And so I would argue that we need desperately reliable systems. And when we make a prediction, when I use a black box, let's say a, a neural net with I don't know how many layers and that black box returns a point estimate, a prediction, how am I supposed to interpret this? How, what kind of trust can I put in this number? And this is the point of departure of this talk, which is that we need to be able to quantify, convey uncertainty and, and, and produce reliable predictions to decision makers. And the way we're gonna think about this in this lecture is extremely simple, which is that I'm gonna say that you can use whatever tool you want. It might be uh, a neural net, it can be XGBoost, it can be a combination thereof, but I'm gonna hold you to a high standard. And the standard I'm gonna hold you to is that instead of giving me a prediction point, uh, you're gonna have to give me a range or a set of possible values, which we're gonna call C of X, with a property that no matter what, the range that you produce contains the predicted value, uh, the, the correct label Y 90% of the time. So what we're gonna want is we want to kind of report, uh, summarize what we've learned from the experience of others in the form of a prediction interval. This is not a confidence interval. We are not trying to predict the mean of a population. We're trying to predict a future observation and there's a big difference between the two. And so I want to, re to focus on prediction intervals that contain the true value of Y 90% of the time. Okay, that's a goal. And the question is, whenever we look at the predictions that in very sensitive applications, why don't we see such prediction intervals more often? To me, they're absolutely critical because they're reliable and they convey a measure of uncertainty 
which decision makers should know about. They convey how much I've learned from the experience of others about this particular applicant. So why is it that we don't see prediction intervals? Perhaps because uh, we're using extremely fancy methods such as gradient boosting, random forest, neural nets, and so on. Uh, for all practical purposes, these tools are so complex that we are pa way past simple regressions and we don't have formulas to actually compute uh, prediction uh, intervals by hand. And that's maybe why we don't see them uh, being reported very often, right? It's, these systems are very hard to understand. We don't really know what they do. And so it's very hard to uh, quantify uncertainty. Yet we'll see that it's surprisingly possible via these ideas from conformal prediction, uh, which I'll tell you about. So we want to predict with confidence. Uh, and this is where my talk is going to be quite statistical in nature. So, <clears throat> so let's say that we have a response Y and we have covariates X and I want to predict Y from X. Um, a naive approach would be to get a training sample, um, fit a regression curve, which is a red curve you see, and then look at the residual, that is a di difference between the observed values and the prediction, the point on the red curve. Uh, these are called the residuals. And so on the right here, if you can see my cursor, you see a histogram of these residuals. Uh, we look at the residuals and we build a predictive set of the form. Well, we look at the quantize of the residual and we build a predictive set of the form mu hat, which is a regression function, plus or minus the quantize of these residuals. And every statistician knows that this would absolutely not work. This cannot possibly lead to valid prediction intervals because obviously um, the residuals are much smaller on the training set than I will see on future samples. And this phenomenon will be of course extreme for neural nets where if you see a lot of the literature on neural networks, people drive down the training error down to zero, which means that essentially the residual will all be zero, this quantile will zero, and your uh, prediction band will be infinitely thin. So that doesn't work and enters conformal prediction, which is a field that was started by some computer scientists in the late 90s, largely around uh, Vladimir Wolf, and you see here is the first paper on this subject, uh, which will show that predictive inference is possible under no assumption uh, whatsoever, which is really great. So um, before I dive into the mechanics of conformal prediction, I want to uh, have a few words. So this is a field, as I mentioned, that largely evolved around Vladimir Wolf. He's a pioneer. And uh, he did a lot of work back then. He still does a lot of work today, uh, contributing new ideas pretty much on a monthly basis, which is quite remarkable. Uh, from the stats community, I think two people played a key role, Jing, namely Jing Lei and Larry Wasserman, who understood the importance of the work of Vladimir and were able to translate uh, this into statistical language. And of course, along the way, made wonderful contributions of their own. So what's the idea? The idea to a statistician looks completely obvious, but still let's rehearse it. Um, and the idea is of course, that we're gonna look at the residual, not on the training sample, but on a holdout set or test set. And so instead of looking at the values of the residual on the training set, I'm gonna look at it on an independent set. And so I'm gonna just look at the quantiles of the residuals on a, train, on a test set. And so by definition, um, if I draw now a band with the same quantiles, but the quantiles now are calculated on the test set, by definition, 90% of the future test points will fall within the band. And so this can be formalized in a theorem. And the theorem is like this, which is that if I choose Q to be, let's say the 90th percentile of the absolute value of the residual on my calibration set, think that I've not used to actually fit the regression function, then the kind of nice theorem is that if I construct a prediction band in this naive way, uh, it contains a true 90% of the time. And so you exactly achieve the kind of guarantee that I advocated at the beginning. So, 
Um, you can do this by looking at the misfit, looking at the absolute values of the residual, but in general, and this is where I'm going to be a little bit abstract, you can use any statistic you like that is any conformity score of this form S of X, Y. This is an arbitrary function of X and Y. And so you can choose any function you like of X and Y. And you could actually build your predictive set as a set of values Y for which your score evaluated on X and Y is lower than the quantile values of the scores that you have observed. And so for those, you know, this is why it's called a conformity score. You're going to include Y if the score for X, Y is low enough, that is it conforms to past observation and you're going to exclude it from your prediction interval if it doesn't. And when you use an arbitrary function like this, and S can be anything you like, the theorem is exactly the same. That is, you can look at the quantiles of the scores that you have observed on the calibration set, something that has not been used for training. And then uh, you apply this recipe and you're guaranteed that this prediction interval uh, will contain the true label 90% of the time or whatever uh, fraction of the time alpha, one minus alpha uh, you like. And so this is really a wonderful result. Um, and just you know, I thought I would give you a sense of why this is true. Uh, and it's very natural, again, to statisticians. People perhaps in the audience have worked on non-parametric statistics and rank tests, and there's a very strong connection with what statisticians have been, done, have been doing for dec almost half a century now. And this is this, that is, if you give me data points xi, yi, which are iid, and more generally, if they are exchangeable, um, and so this would be, uh, we can calculate the scores for these data points, right? So this can be, for example, in the simplest case, this can be the absolute values of the residuals. And I would get scores, which are these yellow points. And then I have my test point, xn plus one, yn plus one. And by definition, because this new test point is exchangeable with the points in the training sample, then um, the rank all these scores are exchangeable. And as a result, the rank of this score for a test point is discrete uniform. That is, where is it positioned among the, 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 the yellow points is absolutely uniform. And because it's discrete uniform, then if I say, well, what's the chance that it's in the 90th percent uh, lowest value? Well, it's exactly 90 percent. And so, that's a, basically the result right there. Therefore, the chance that your score for a test point is below Q, since you chose Q to be the 90th percentile of the yellow point is exactly 90%. And so, um, so you have the result you're looking for. And so you see that all what you were using is exchangeability between the test point and the training samples. And we make no modeling assumption whatsoever. Okay, so uh, as this talk is organized around three vignettes, so, uh, so this is what we know about conformal prediction and of course the efficiency of uh, conformal prediction will rely on being able to come up with good scores and that's what I'm going to try to discuss next. If you, if you want again to draw an analogy with what statisticians are very familiar with, you have a framework for hypothesis testing, and now the question is, which statistics should you use? How should you compute your p-values? Okay, so let me first, uh, to introduce some new ideas that we, we come up, came up with, uh, let me um, give you a, a sense of a setting with perfect knowledge. So suppose I actually knew the conditional distribution of y given x, then uh, because it is known then at each point x, I know the response, the distribution of the response y, and I can, I can compute the high quantile of this distribution, I can compute the low quantile of this distribution, and of course I can connect the dots and give you a, confid a prediction interval um, for any value of x. And what we can see in this picture is because we have heteroscedasticity, we would see that the length of this interval varies greatly with where you are in space. Okay, 
So now if you look at what I've been discussing before, the method of Oak, um, it, it's not adaptive in the sense that because I'm looking at your prediction function, which is actually uh, in black here, and I'm gonna enlarge it plus or minus a quantile of the out of sample residuals. Um, this actually produces uh, confidence prediction intervals that are valid, but are not adaptive. That is their width, for example, is constant as a function of X, whereas if I knew the conditional distribution, I can see that I would fit some shorter prediction interval that would adapt to the heteroscedasticity. I mean, the method works, it delivers, that is, it shows that uh, it achieves the coverage you want, but um, you are not adaptive at all. So, of course, I don't have perfect knowledge. I don't know what is the distribution of Y given X. And so our idea is very simple. And it started with an observation uh, that we had in, at Stanford with my, my students, which is that if you try to predict the quantiles of the conditional distribution, why do you start by estimating the mean? It doesn't make much sense to us. And so the idea was, why don't we just bring in regression quantile? You see the object of inference, if you will, are really the quantiles of this conditional distribution. So rather than estimating the conditional mean, why don't you just go and try estimating these uh, quantiles directly? And we, for to do this, we're gonna use the wonderful ideas of Conquer and Bassett on quantile regression. So operationally, this is extremely simple to do actually, which is like, let's say I wanna fit a neural net. All I'm gonna do in scikit-learn or in PyTorch is to uh, change the loss function and to actually impose a loss function, which is not a squared loss, which would fit essentially the conditional mean, but what people call in the field, the pinball loss, which is a field, a, a loss that looks like this, where it looks like the absolute values, except that the slopes are not the same. And I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, but for example, if alpha was 0.5, then this would essentially estimate the conditional median. And by varying alpha, you're basically estimating the, the quantiles of your distribution. And so the idea is to try to estimate the quantile directly by just refitting your neural nets, not using the squared loss, but using this pinball loss, and to produce two quantile functions, one upper quantile, maybe at the 95th percentile, one at the fifth percentile, hoping that you would capture 90% of the point and report valid confidence intervals. Now, would this idea work? And well, obviously it doesn't. Uh, there is no guarantees for quantile regression that I'm aware of. And so this is shown in this test example where I got a fresh sample of data and then uh, I was checking whether my quantiles actually include 90% of the test data, data I have not seen before. And, you know, not surprisingly, I'm overfitting and therefore the coverage is 72% rather than the target 90%. Now, of course, I can make this extreme. Again, if you imagine training a neural net, which will drive down the training error to zero, you would get 0% coverage. Okay, so what are we gonna do? Well, that's where we're gonna use ideas from conformal prediction to fix this. And how are we gonna fix this? Um, so we uh, say, okay, so we're gonna partition the data set into in sample and out of sample, so a, a proper training set and what we're gonna call a calibration set. On the training set, I fit my quantile regression functions and on the calibration set, I'm gonna see how well I'm doing. And you see on the right, we have green points. These are calibrated points that were not used to fit the quantile estimates. Um, and so for each green point, I'm gonna measure, I'm gonna, I'm gonna score it. I'm gonna actually calculate a score exactly of the form we've, we've discussed before. And what is this score? This score is very simply uh, stated, is I'm gonna take a green point and I'm gonna calculate the distance to the nearest boundary. Okay, so if this is this point up here, the nearest distance is here. If this point is here, maybe the nearest boundary is here. So it's the nearest di vertical distance to the boundary. And the trick is that we're gonna give it a positive sign if it's outside of 
the prediction band, the naive prediction band, and a negative sign if it's inside. So it's a sign distance. You're positive if I missed you, you're negative if I caught you. And now let's say that I've got 500 green points or 500 test points, and I'm interested in constructing a 90th percent confidence prediction interval. I'm going to look at the 90th percentile of these scores, so the 450th largest value of these 500 values, and I'm going to call this Q, right? And this is what we see over here. I'm going to call this Q. And now the formula for building the prediction interval is extremely simple. C of X is simply going to be, I'm going to shift these two curves up and down by Q and minus Q. And so the prediction interval is simply the lower quantile minus Q, the upper quantile is going to be up, the upper naive quantile estimates plus Q. Now this is quite interesting because if indeed I was a bit perhaps overfitting the data, then what we would see is that I would not have 10% of the point outside of range, I would have more, in which case Q would be positive. And in which case what this formula would do is it would actually uh, enlarge the prediction band correctly. If on the other hand, I was a bit uh, conservative and that's my nature, uh, then maybe I might actually be uh, too, I might actually have a coverage which is too high, which let's say I would achieve 95% when you ask me only 90, in which case Q would be negative. And what this method would actually do is it would shrink the prediction band. And finally, if you gave me a quantile that were just good in the sense that they do the job 90% of the time, then the 90s Q would be essentially zero and I would not touch what you've given me. And so, so you can see that this method is really adaptive. Now, when I use this method on data I have not seen, uh, well, you know, I want 90%. In this case, I got 90.01%. So it's too good to be true but you know, it's a theorem and we are leveraging the ideas of conformal prediction to show that this actually leads to valid coverage. So you can see side by side the two methods, the method originally proposed by Wolfk, uh, which you know, essentially produces prediction intervals of fixed width, uh, whereas our method uh, is highly adaptive to where you are in space. Uh, as a result, um, you can achieve, you can be far more efficient and so the average length of the interval in, in our case is 2.18 versus 2.91 for the original method. And this is because you achieve adaptivity while the original method is not. So um, this is what I was trying to do. The next plot is what I explained uh, visually on the previous slide. Uh, on the right, you see the length of the interval as a function of X with our method. And the other method, well, it has constant width, so you know it's just flat. One thing that I'm going to talk to you a lot about is uh, whether you achieve conditional coverage for a given value of x. So in principle, we've known for a long time that actually conditional coverage, condition on the value of the covariates, is impossible without making assumptions. And but still, we can hope that in practice we do well. And what you see that the new method is in blue. Uh, achieve essentially uh, constant uh, conditional coverage as a function of where you are in covariate space, where the other method tends to overshoot and undershoot. Like imagine you're in finance and you're trying to predict uh, returns. And you know, if you have uh, intervals of fixed widths or re returns of stocks, you know, if the volatility is high, you're going to undercover. If it's low, um, you're going to overcover. And so you, you will not be adaptive to volatility while our method seems to be adaptive to volatility. Okay, so we've used this on, on real data as well. And uh, this is a data set that we're gonna discuss a little bit. Uh, this is a medical expenditure panel survey where the goal is to predict healthcare system utilization measured by the number of visits to a doctor's office, a hospital and so on. Uh, and we want to predict this from covariates such as age, your marital status, your poverty status, your health status, your insurance type, and so on and so forth. It's a data set with about 16,000 subjects and 140 features. 
and, and, and that's the goal. Okay, so if we look at the, the new method versus the old method side by side, well, they promise the same thing, and that's what you see, that the marginal coverage is spot on 90%. However, when we look at conditional coverage, which is we're trying to find regions in X space for which it's hard to cover, uh, then when we look hard, we can see that uh, the method I proposed uh, is extremely adaptive, that it's very hard to lose coverage condition on X, whereas this method, this other method, as I mentioned, tends to over or under cover. As a result, and this is on real data, um, the intervals that this method produces are much shorter than the intervals uh, from competing methods. So what we can see on this kind of simple plots on a real data set, is that we can achieve better conditional coverage and shorter intervals at the same time, which is a good thing. Now, this is not limited to a, a, a single data set. If you look at the papers we have on this subject, you see that we analyze a lot of data from a lot of different fields. And sort of the conclusion is consistent with what you've seen, that you tend to achieve better conditional coverage and shorter intervals. Okay. All right, so this is really like a part of the talk which is really more geared toward people interested in these methods uh, in uh, improving uh, conformal predictions. Um, so what you we were discussing is, okay, we take a training set and basically we're trying to guess the, the quantize of the conditional distribution of y given x. And we can do this by quantile regression, we can do this by other methods by just fitting conditional distributions directly, perhaps via the wonderful new methods of my colleague, Jerry Friedman. And what the conformalization step would do really is to shift these intervals, these kind of bound curves up and down to achieve coverage. Now, one weakness in this method is you're shifting the uh, bands by exactly the same amount of time. And you could say, well, Emmanuel, can't you just not be a bit more adaptive than this? And the answer is yes, you can. That is why we don't have to shift these curves by the same amount um, uh, each time. So we can shift them by an amount which depends on X. And let me explain how this would work. So what I could do is um, I could actually fit uh, conditional distributions, uh, perhaps by quantile regression, perhaps by any other method you want to think of. Um, and so at each point X, I have a, an estimated distribution of Y. And of course, a naive way to construct a prediction band would be to just look at the quantiles of my conditional distribution estimate. Okay, and so this would be my naive prediction. Now, would this work? Absolutely not, it would not work. So what I can do now, and I think now you start getting the picture, what I can do now is I can, um, Basically, on my holdout set, on my calibration set, for any value of the parameter tau, which was, is a raw coverage level, we know, I could see what is actually the realized coverage on the holdout set. And you're gonna see a curve like this, right? You might say, oh, you know, I'm gonna use tau equals 90%, hoping to achieve 90%, but on the calibration set, you only achieve 85%. But then you can, you try a, a higher value of tau, 95%, and then there you would see that you achieve 90%. Okay, so you, you, you just plot a curve like this and you choose tau such that on the observed data on the calibration set, you achieve the coverage you want. In this case, it means that you should pick tau to be 95% to achieve 90%. And now you see the method is extremely simple. Now you say, I'm gonna set my prediction band to be the naive prediction band, but evaluated at this tau hat. So that is, I'm gonna choose a 95% nominal level to get 90% coverage. And that would be valid as well. Now, what's good about this is for those of you who are interested in discrete labels, uh, there's a natural extension to discrete labels. And so, um, uh, so, as you know, you know, if I'm using my favorite machine learning algorithm, let's say neural nets, you know, the softmax layer will produce estimated of class labels given X, right? So I have a pi hat of YX. And so for each 
input X, I get, you know, I have a bunch of classes, A, B, C, D, and E, and so on, and I have my guess of what they are, but these are, of course, uncalibrated. All right, and so if I were, if these guesses were absolutely correct, uh, then what I could do is I could obviously say, well, you want 90% coverage in a situation like this, I would ask, well, include A, include B, include C, include, you know, sort the labels by decreasing order of probability up till you get a mass of 90% and that's what you return in your prediction set. And so you achieve 90% uh, prediction. Um, and so in this case, you, you would achieve ABC. Would that work? Well, no, it would not. And so um, what you can do instead is you can uh, repeat the procedure I just mentioned where you say, well, I don't know what calibrated what level of tau I want to use. So let me again, for different value of tau, we draw this curve, figure out what tau I should use. Let's say again that, you know, if you want 90%, you should really use 95% because you want to compensate for overfitting. And so what that means is maybe, you know, you would fall over here uh, on the left side, you know, this would, what would be required to observe 90%. And so instead of, of including ABC, you would in this case include ABC and D. And that's how the method would work on, on discrete data. And so that's another thing we proposed with students, which uh, we submitted to NeurIPS uh, this year. Now, all the methods I've discussed uh, work very well uh, in the sense that you have the guarantee. So it might be a bit hard for you to see where are the conformity scores, but they are lurking in the background, believe me. And for all these methods um, that produces prediction sets, you can guarantee that the coverage is between one minus alpha and essentially it's practically equal to one minus alpha. It's between one minus alpha and one minus pi alpha plus one over the number of points in the calibration set. So it says it's between 90 and 90.3 if you have like 300 points in the calibration set. Okay, so, so you have validity. Now I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna skip this because I'm, I'm running a bit out of time. Um, uh, there were methods to actually do calibration with discrete labels, but they were again, not adaptive. And this method really improves on, on earlier methods by bringing adaptivity. And I can demonstrate this both on synthetic data set and on real data set. But because I'm running a bit out of time, I'm gonna skip this part. Okay, I can come back to this during a Q&A. Okay. I'll talk now about um, uh, uh, fair, you know, what the people call algorithmic fairness uh, and using ideas from conformal prediction to say something intelligent about this. Okay, and this is work again with my students and uh, Kara Sabati from, from Stanford. Okay, so remember we talked about uh, machine learning algorithms potentially biased against groups. Um, and this has been widely reported and of course, we need to make sure that these AI tools are not discriminating. And, uh, and there's been a lot of work in the machine learning literature to actually try to address this. Uh, what we, you will see now is a complete departure from what you may have heard about. And so, and so let's go through this. So we need to support important decisions, who is gonna get paroled, who is not, who is gonna get bailed, who is not, who might be, a, who you might hire, who you might not hire. And so we need to be able to communicate on certain decision makers. Um, we need to overstate, not to overstate, sorry, what can be inferred from the machine learning algorithm. We need to be honest about what we can predict. And that of course falls in the framework of conformal prediction, but we also need to treat people equitably. And so I'll just say uh, a, a few things about the uh, state of affairs in algorithmic fairness. I think there's something I, I, I do not like in what I see is that in the machine learning community, it seems that to me that people conflate the risk assessment problem that is a prediction problem from the policy problem. And so they mix the two, uh, which actually may end up harming people rather than helping them. Uh, I would like to argue that our job as statisticians and data scientists is to present the fact to policymakers and not baking in some ideology. 
And so what we'll see is that we'll see a way to decouple the risk assessment problems, the prediction problem from the policy problem. Because it, suppose you could predict with no error, like let's say I can correctly predict that an inmate will commit another crime with 20% chance if released from jail. This fact in and on itself does not determine a policy. And so, um, so what you'll see is quite different from what I see uh, written elsewhere. And let, to, uh, to explain this, let me go back to um, my example that we've seen before, where you know, we're trying to use uh, covariates to predict healthcare system utilization. One thing I had not really highlighted before is that we have a sensitive attribute in this list of covariates, which is race. Okay, and so in particular, in this data set, we have 9,600 9, non-white individuals and 6,000 white individuals. And as you know, a race is a protected attribute. So if I fit a neural net, uh, for some reason that are not clear, I can observe, and these are just empirical observation, that the neural net will tend to overestimate the response of the non-white group. So to overestimate your utilization, of healthcare services and underestimate it for white people. And so you can see in this case, it's not uh, a huge difference between the uh, white and non-white groups. Um, you know, for example, the white group uh, is undercovered, the non-white group is overcovered. The difference is not huge, but it is there. And you can imagine that having a regression function overestimate the response for a group vis-a-vis -vis another group might lead to discriminatory decisions. And so we want to avoid that. Okay, so what we are advocating here is to use conformal prediction with one extra step to make sure that essentially our predictions are unbiased. And so if suppose we have two groups, male and female, um, what I would like to do and to require, and now here I'm going to be prescriptive. And what I'm going to require is that I want your algorithm, whatever you use, whether it's neural nets or XGBoost or whatever you want, I want your prediction band to contain the true label 90% of the time, no matter the value of the protected attribute. Okay, so no matter whether you're male or female. So I'm going to ask for coverage condition on things that we care about. And we, we argue that this is a way you should summarize what you've learned about people like yourself to uh, decision makers. So I think this is a way of rigorously quantifying uncertainty. You give a range to decision makers that contains the true label 90% of the time or 95 or 99, whatever you want. And that range is correct no matter the group you belong to. And if the interval is long, so be it. It means that you've not been able to learn that much from past data. And in a sense, because now you're unbiased across groups, I think it treats individuals equitably. So you see, it's a, it's a risk assessment tool where I'm going to actually tell you what I've learned from past data about a current individual with a guarantee that I'm correct 90% of the time and a guarantee that my, the, my, my chance of being correct does not depend on sensitive attributes. So how you would do this? Well, one way to do this is of course to decouple the problem and treat men and say, I have two groups, men and women, to treat them separately. Now that's not very intelligent. You could imagine that you could do better Right? So that's a naive way to use conformal prediction is to treat each group separately and, and, and run the algorithm. A better way that we found is to say, you know, I'm going to, let's say, fit my quantize on the group jointly, but then I'm going to calibrate separately. Okay? And so if you do this, you'll achieve uh, the coverage, the unbiased coverage I mentioned before. So what you can do is you can pull everyone to learn the model, but then when it's time to calibrate and report honest intervals, that's where you separate the two groups so that you achieve conditional coverage. And uh, maybe I won't bother you with, uh, with too many numerical results, but you know, if we apply this to this MEPS data set, and I've talked quite a few times already, 
then what you'll see when you use this interval, and of course it's a theorem, and that's what you see in practice, which is that this interval, uh, these ways of constructing interval would actually correct the biases in the methods so that you achieve exactly the coverage 9, 0.90x, 0.90x on white and non-white groups and still achieves uh, intervals that are quite short. Okay, so you have a method to produce short intervals uh, by training jointly, but calibrating separately so that you treat people equitably. So I'm quite passionate about this. I think it's important that as we deploy uh, machine learning algorithms, we need to make sure that we can summarize information in a way that does not lead to discriminatory practices. And that's important. And I think when you tune conformal prediction to do this, that's what you achieve, uh, recognizing that data analysis is non neutral. Uh, I mentioned it before, I'm a bit troubled by the literature on uh, machine learning. It seems that data analysts sometimes have decided to play gods. It's not up to them to decide to make decisions. What they have to do is they have to inform decision makers about what past data tells them about the future, not to make decisions. And I think right now decision making and prediction have been conflated and I think that's a problem. And what I like about the method I presented is that you should first do no harm. That is, you know, it's been proven, it's been established that some of the method we see in the uh, algorithmic fairness literature can actually harm the people they intend to protect. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move on. Uh, I want to kind of present my last vignette and uh, unless I have to stop now, in which case I can wrap up, but I had one extra vignette. I can see I still have five or 10 minutes, but I want to go back to Bani to kind of see how I'm doing on time. You're doing fine, Emmanuel. You can go I'm ahead. I'm doing please. fine? Please. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I wanted to just show like, exp again, expand the panorama of things you can do with conformal prediction. I think it's a wonderful tool that statisticians should know about. And, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing. So it's a paper we wrote with Li Wa Lei, uh, a postdoc of mine, and we submitted it like a few months ago, and it's about counterfactual inference. So I understand that for people not familiar with causal inference, this might be a bit remote, but you know, to these people, I'd say that this is an important problem and, uh, and maybe there's something for them to, to take. Um, so, um, so we have individuals uh, and these individuals come and they're going to be either assigned uh, a treatment or a placebo or they're going to be put in a treatment group or a control group based on the values of their covariates. And so, um, you know, I might actually observe a person with covariates X, X might be age, blood pressure, comorbidity, blah, blah, blah. And based on this value, I might decide by flipping a coin, which may not be unbiased, to actually put these people in a treatment group or a control group. And this become, these people, you know, the red people are becoming treatment and the treated and the blue people receive the placebo. They're in the control group. All right, and uh, this, this chance of being assigned a treatment uh, given the value of the covariance, it's called the propensity score in the causal inference literature. All right, now subject come in and the big question in the sciences is this, which is a person was a, a, a assigned to a treatment group, but we would like to know what would have, what would the counterfactual, that is, what would be the response if this person had actually been put in the control group and vice versa. We take an individual here, which is, who is blue, and we might ask, there's a counterfactual, this is what Don Rubin calls the science table. There's a counterfactual for this individual, which is, what would be the value of why had this person been treated? Of course, you can only observe one because you can either apply the treatment or not. You cannot apply both at the same time, obviously. And so, but the kind of big question in causal inference, at least in this potential outcome framework, is to make an educated guess about the value of Y that you did not observe. That is, for this control unit, 
what would be his why or her why had she been treated? And likewise, for this treated unit, what would have been her why if she had not been treated? Right? So in this data science table, we observe the first row, but we ask about the second row. Okay. All right. And so just to put this graphically, I take this individual. This is a specific individual. This, people, this person was put in the control group. I want to know why one. Okay. And of course, I don't get to see this. And I will never get to see this. But I still want to know about why one. Now, as you'll see, we are away from conformal prediction. Because let's take my problem. I take this blue person and I want, you know, this shaded person is that same person, but submit, subject to treatment. And that person I don't get to see, and I don't get to see people like this person. And here's why. The only samples I've got are in the top row, okay? And these are the people I get to see, and you see their distributions. Here, you ask me to actually predict the value of Y1 for an individual, but for an individual that was actually put in the control group, I can see sometimes, this is the data I have, I can see sometimes values of Y1, but these are for people who were assigned to a treatment group because their X was different. And now you can see that between the examples I have, the red people, the dark red people, and the shaded red people, there is a big difference that they don't actually follow the same distribution. Their response condition on X is the same, but the distribution of X is not the same. They are different. There is what in machine learning we call a covariate shift, right? The distribution of X is not the same in the two groups. I'm going to try to learn from these people what would be the response to treatment, but these people are fundamentally different from these people because these people were assigned treatment. These people were assigned control based on their X, and so they're fundamentally different. And so there's a covariate mismatch, and conformal prediction doesn't say much about this, and so We'll see what we can do. Now, in pictures, this is a bit the situation we're looking at. Here we see the distribution of X given that T equals one, that you were assigned a treatment. And here given that T equals zero. So it's very clear what happens at the bottom. At the bottom, you say, if your value of X is low, I'm gonna put you in the treatment group. If it's high, I'm gonna put you in the control group, right? And then we can see that these two populations are not the same. This is what I get to see. I get to see these red points, but I do not get to see these blue points. Um, this is what I really want to infer, but I never get to see this. What's clear now is that these two distributions are not the same because the distribution of X is, has changed. And really here we're dealing with the fundamental problem that be, between training and testing, something about the distribution changed. And we need to address this. So, Mathematically, um, I think we can formulate the problem as follows, where we have IID samples, XI, YIs, and they're sampled from a distribution P of X times the likelihood, the distribution of Y given X to construct prediction interval C hat of X. But now the requirement, and this is where the trickery comes in, I want that now your coverage be not with respect to this distribution, but there might be a shift in the distribution. I want coverage with respect to a new distribution in which the distribution of Q is different. Okay, and so we have WX, which is the ratio between the likelihood ratio, the, the, the ratio between the distribution under testing vis-a-vis -vis distribution. And so we are outside of conformal prediction because in conformal prediction, I need exchangeability. So new test points need to look like old test points, and therefore the method we've seen do not apply. Okay, so conformal inference is without covariate shift is, you know, I think you get the idea now. You conform, you compute uh, test statistics, you plot the histogram of your conformity scores, and you're gonna include in your prediction interval all values of Y such that the score is not too large, below the appropriate quantize of the scores. But now we have a different distribution under testing, and so we need to adapt to this. And what, might, what will change is that now the distribution of the scores under testing will change. But remarkably with the Ryan, Rina, and Aditya, the 
people I highlighted at the beginning of the talk, we are able to actually um, adjust conformal prediction so that we can actually make valid predictions. And the prediction, the, the way you do this is now you're gonna compute a, quant a, a, a quantile of a histogram, but basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna reweight the samples in the histogram by P, which is this W's that I mentioned before. This ratio between the likelihood under the training set test sets versus the likelihood under the test set. And so you're gonna reweight the samples in your histogram. So you're gonna shift the histogram, recalculate a new quantile and say, now I'm not gonna use the quantiles of the empirical distribution of the scores. I'm gonna use a quantile of a reweighted empirical distribution of the scores, which in this example would be this one. And if we do this, we show that you, you have exact uh, coverage. What that means for uh, counterfactual inference is that by you know, uh, setting WX to be the ratio of propensity scores, you can actually do something which under no modeling assumption whatsoever, something which is a bit eerie in some ways, which is that you can actually predict, you can actually predict with extreme confidence the value of, let's say, the response to a treatment of a control unit. Uh, in such a way that you are correct 90% or 95 or 99% of the time, no matter value, what value of alpha you choose. This holds with no extra assumptions. Now, of course, you'll say, well, in reality, I don't really know the propensity scores. I can estimate it. I'm going to skip all of this and say that uh, in the case where you don't know the propensity scores, but you have a good estimate, uh, then you have, you know, a bunch of results that in the causal inference literature is called double robustness, where as your estimates become consistent, then the equation you have at the top, the inequality you have at the top holds approximately true. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. What that says is that you can produce a range of values for a control unit had this unit received treatment. And this range is valid 90% of the time or 95% of the time. So you can actually make counterfactual inference. I, I feel I need to wrap up. So, um, of course, when we apply this to a data set, we find that it's a theorem. So what we show is that the theorem works. What we were a bit surprised is that a lot of methods have been proposed in the literature to actually do things like this, uh, but they don't work. And um, I don't know. So, you know, these are a bunch of methods that people have proposed that just really, really fall short of what's being advertised. Now, these conformal prediction methods, you can wrap them against, again, around any algorithm you like. Uh, we use BART, we use boosting, we use random forest, and so on. It doesn't matter what you use, it always works. What you will get is depending on the algorithm you use, and this is the point that we, the plot, the point of the plot you see on the right here, depending on the algorithm you use, you might get shorter or longer prediction intervals. In this case, it seems that it was a good idea to select random forest because among all the valid methods, this is the one that tend to produce uh, shorter intervals. By the way, the red, the blue line here is uh, essentially the length that you could achieve if I, you actually knew exactly the right distribution, which of course you don't. All right, so uh, I will extend this. Maybe I, I'm going to wrap up. I'll say that you can extend this to actually do much more than what I've said, which is for individual that you have never seen, an individual that has not received either the, control, the placebo or the treatment. There's something extremely important in the literature, which is called the individual treatment effect, which is the difference between Y1 and Y0, response to treatment versus response to placebo. And we can do exactly the same. We can actually use ideas from conformal prediction to say this, I've never seen this individual, yet I can predict with confidence what would be the difference between her response to treatment and her response to placebo. And there's a way to do this. Okay, um, things that I'm gonna skip. Uh, um, you can do data reuse when data is scarce. You don't want to do the kind of splitting, you know, use a holdout set to calibrate your predictions. There's a way to use data to both um, train the model and calibrate it at the same time. 
Uh, this goes under the name of Jackknife Plus and CV Plus. This is again the joint work with the wonderful colleagues I mentioned early on. Uh, it's related to ideas from cross-conformer prediction. Uh, and so uh, if you don't have a lot of data, this is what you should be using instead. And this can be wrapped, this method can be wrapped against uh, around everything I've discussed in this talk. Okay, so I'll skip this. Um, uh, we have websites and code, but because my hour is up, I want to conclude by first thanking you for attending this lecture. Uh, it was a very personal tour of conformal prediction. I hope I, con I managed to convey how exciting this field of research is. I hope I managed to convey the importance of uncertainty quantification. And I'm really grateful for the work of Vladimir Volk and Larry Wasserman and Jing Lei to really kind of bring into the statistical communities these ideas from conformal prediction, because I think they are applicable to meet the highest professional standards and these are really needed uh, at the moment. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>